perimenopause. <laughs> perimenopause. Perimenopause. <laughs> Give me all your raw impressions, your thoughts, your words, your time. Tell me things I'm not prepared for, yet blow my mind. (laughs) Give me all your raw impressions. Give me all your raw impressions. Hello. Hmm, I like that new line. Yeah, That's I was a good thinking one. we were we were talking earlier today because we we do speak to each other mm. in private quite a bit. Mm-hmm. We have a private life too, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking about how, um, you know, like I've been writing that song, the Raw Impression song. It's kind of about how you communicate, how you have to have like a very, you have to have good communication with people to get things done. And I realize it's like, and for you and I, it's like, yeah, we have to do it because we have kids and we have a lot of very serious things we deal with. And honesty is very important to um, managing things better as you go forward. And I'm realizing that that's probably something that I need to adopt in like almost every part of my life. Like I need to say difficult things to to people, other people that I love. Hmm. Sometimes you want to shield people from the really difficult stuff. Like you didn't want to tell me about the the bad review folk implosion got in pitchfork. I was not, I was not planning on speaking about this, but I'm just saying it. you <laughs> did okay. shield me from that to a degree. degree. Although to you a didn't have degree. to, you didn't have to, but although I, I, I have never, to say, I never told you about it till yesterday. Yeah. And I didn't find out about it until yesterday when I was having, a, <laughs> we were having a, a meeting, the folk implosion, we're having a meeting, you know, was, mm-hmm. uh, thinking about things going forward, like our, our English tour, our UK tour, I should say. Yeah, we'll put Which links to up, that. It's coming up in November. But um, yeah, I'm like, you know, you got to say, it, it, you have to say difficult things. Should I have told you about it? No, I'm not. Absolutely. I, I don't care. I'm glad you didn't. I'm glad you didn't because like, yeah, bad reviews, you know, even if they're, I mean, I the thing is, I think a lot of bad, like reviews always have nuggets of truth in them. There's very few bad reviews that are just purely like just someone out to trash somebody. Just, yeah, that's true. I mean, that's, that, that used to be kind of like that back in the day, but it's not really like that now. You know, journalists have lost a lot of the power that they had. They're, everything's kind of shifted. So, um, but no, that was fine that you didn't mention that to me because that, that was, it was good because now I, now I will think about it, but. Have you read the review? No. no yeah. I I, I only read it when it came out, which was right when the album came out. And uh, That's I, weird. No one told me about it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we were all thinking the same thing. Don't 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 need to tell Lou about this one. I um Yeah, so there was a pitchfork review for the new folk implosion album, Walk Through Me. It's not I I actually should go back and reread it. Um I I don't, I don't know what to say other than just, um, at the time I thought you're not mentioning it, so I'm not going to mention it and let's just exist as if this, this review didn't happen. And if you did know about it, you're choosing not to tell me about it and I know about it and I'm choosing not to tell you about it. So, um, it doesn't change, you know, what you have to do, right? I mean, you still have to like do your thing and you have to get on the road and bring the show to people and perform for them. If it's well written and it seems thoughtful, you could read it. And if you have the emotional maturity, take some (laughs) constructive criticism from it and move forward. But it's also so subjective, right? I mean, it's just one person's opinion. That's, that's you against one person who does wield a lot of power, right? Or maybe, maybe there isn't power anymore. Maybe people don't care, but Um, I do think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of music that people really enjoy that I, I don't really have a taste for, and I'm sure it gets very high ratings. And so it's all, it's deeply personal and it didn't feel like, I just didn't feel like necessary to bring it up to you. So I, I didn't, I didn't really even want to bring it up now. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's done now. (laughs) Life goes on. Um, you know, I think. 
But when John and I got back together and started playing songs, I got really practicing. I kind of got more interested in us playing new stuff. You were practicing. Yeah. You know? Like I really like playing with them. And I thought the way that all the songs from the album kind of were taking shape live were cool. Exactly. And, you know, I, started, I just started yeah. thinking about the future, which is what I used to do back in the day too. It's like we didn't, I didn't release something. And I mean, you did, there was kind of the way, certainly with like Sebado records, you release it and then you wait for the, hmm. it, it was, it was quite, it was a real process back then. And it's real different now. You know, it's like, you don't, the, the cycle was much longer back then. You'd spend a year making a record, then a year kind of waiting almost a year for it to come out and then another year of touring for it. And then just, so one piece of one, you know, one statement, one album would basically become your talking point for the next two to three years. And yeah, it was so, true. so yeah. enervating. And, and so uh, just, it just slowly uh, eats away at you and sort of destroys your ability to just be spontaneous. And I think one great thing about the folk implosion was that I did that during, I did that during the nineties. So I kept things moving through my brain and, and I was always thinking forward to another project. And one cool thing about one of the many cool things about getting back together with John is, yeah, we made a record, which was cool. But that kind of gave us the reason to kind of hit. It was just another part of our story. And, um, and yeah. really the story to me is like the minute we started practicing for the, for the new record, I started to think about the next thing that we were going to do because I just really do enjoy playing with him. And I think we have a lot. Of, still, there's so much to, that we could do and explore. So in a way, like, yeah, I don't – our review right now, it's like that's already – that's a speed bump. We already did that, you know, mm -hmm. you know, so anyway, but I didn't mean to talk about that. I, I think, it's okay, um, you can talk about it. Well, you know, it's been a lot about, um, you know, I've been on this, I'm on this big arena tour now and, um, I don't know. We've been talking about that a lot and I'm kind of curious. I know that you're doing stuff at home. Um, yeah, why don't you, why don't you tell me about it a little bit? Because somehow we do get sidetracked a lot with, just all of our our life management talk. And meanwhile, you've been just, you are doing things during the day. You're sitting on the couch and <laughs> <laughs> what are you, what are you crocheting? I'm are you sitting crocheting on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that's your work spot. You have this really sweet work spot on our couch <laughs> in our, our living room. You have this spot where all of your stuff is within reach and You've got your your little ceramic thing full of yarn that you work from, and mm -hmm. you've got knitting needles around, and uh, yeah, you, it's it's sort of like your workstation. So I'm I'm I do not use the the term couch like you're shitting on the couch all day. <laughs> I don't know. I know what that made it sound doing. like I was. I'm wow. out on the. I'm working my <laughs> ass off for at least an hour and a half a day out here on the road. Mm. What are you doing? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, I could crochet and stand. Um, you know, that's possible. It's true. But uh, I do find it more comfortable to sit on the couch and I don't and do stand it. up and write songs. Yeah. I yeah. don't. I stand up. I don't stand up and write songs. You write the song and then you stand up. Well, I think I was feeling more self-conscious about it because I was just realizing that like my work bleeds out into so many areas of the house, but I suppose that's true of both of us. So, you know, you've also taken over the craft, half of the craft room dining table with your stuff. I take over half the living. I don't know. It's just the home is one big studio. It's one big art studio. And, um, what have I been Izzy, up to? Izzy, grab, yeah. Izzy grabs a bunch of paper and throws it on the floor and all the markers. And Oh, God. Yeah. You know, yes. She's in the middle. She's always in the middle of some sort of project. She is. She is constantly projecting, too. And um, I've been, besides, yeah, the podcast, I that's right. I have a whole nother work life. And um, it's creating. I, I do knitwear and I do crochet and... Uh, I sell my work at a place called Waterway in Turner's Falls, Massachusetts, and it's really cool. It's right on Avenue A. If you're ever in Turner's Falls, you should go check it out. Um, but, uh, it's, it's a gallery space with different artists. So there's lots of different people represented there. And so I've been working on a lot of pieces with fall and winter in mind, a lot of like cozy hats and things like that, and some patchwork pieces, because I'm trying to reuse a lot of 
things that I've already made that were like samples and things like that, that I just sort of like keep over time. And I, I can't part with them cause there's really no reason to part with them, but, um, and so I'm trying to do creative reuse and things like that. And I'm also having to, are you, are you doing that now? Or are you actually, have you, yeah, I am. And, uh, linking pieces, mm-hmm, making some pieces together. And I'm also coming up with like some patchwork cardigans and things like that and doing a variety of different ways of attaching them. So it's like some handwork, some on the sewing machine, it's kind of a collage type thing. And a lot of that, is a forced result of the fact that I have broken knitting machines. And so it's kind of pushing me to do and use my other tools in my toolbox, you know, so that's fine. That's totally fine. It is a goal of mine within the next year to figure out my knitting machine situation. And how many broken knitting machines do we have right now? Four. We have four broken. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> These are really hard to get fixed. This is like, this is kind of, it's kind of like the audio it's all world. Of mine, so. <laughs> it's like the audio world. You have to find like. I live in analog. Really, yeah. Yeah. People, when they, they want these analog tape machines and then it turns out that there's only like three, three people in the United States that can actually calibrate them correctly. And it's truly I'm exaggerating, but I'm, no, I'm saying that every, for every yeah. piece of, because the knitting machines that you do use are like vintage they're, they're all like vintage, vintage yeah. audio gear. It's very similar. It's yeah. a, a sort of a similar, there's sort of these really complicated, um, yes. complicated they're, things that only a few people know how to fix. And apparently the closest people that know how to fix them and are in like New Jersey and New York, which is pretty far from In here. Pennsylvania and Maine. Mm-hmm. I have oh, yet Maine? to have oh, someone, I did have someone, I, I'm part of like a knitting machine repair group on Facebook and I did mm. put a like a desperate call out this year and the responses sort of petered in, but it was like, if I, if we lived in the UK, I would be all set because there's tons of people still using their knitting machines or their vintage knitting machines repairing them. Oh really? Yeah. That's the place. That's the place to be. I don't want to talk about broken knitting machines, but I'm, yes, I'm very busy. And then I'm going to talk about bad reviews and broken knitting machines. Well, and also that I am getting ready, in addition to a big fall turnover of work at Waterway, um, I'm getting ready to build quite a stash for a home sale I do on Small Business Weekend with a couple other artists. And it's sort of like a big, big weekend for me. So Lou will be in the UK with the folk implosion. Uh, so he will miss this year. Sadly, <laughs> just hand me one. Happy for UK, over. but go grab me a knitting machine while you're over there. You know, yeah, sure, no sure. problem. Just fly one back. <laughs> fly one back. So easy. Uh, <laughs> dang! If only it was that easy. If yeah, only. So. But that's yeah. That's what I'm up to. Is just a lot of long handwork. That's a lot of quiet time. I'm listening to the audiobook of The Great Gatsby while I crochet what right made you, it was it was free it was free i was looking on my phone for because i like to listen to audiobooks while i work uh and sit on the couch while i'm working <laughs> <laughs> and uh anyway i was i was looking through a list that was like these are the classics that you have to have read in your lifetime you know like don't don't die without having read these books and the great Gatsby was on like a best of list. And I thought, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to read the great Gatsby. So then I was looking at it and there's multiple different options of audiobook versions of the great Gatsby. It's not okay. just like there's one, there's different people reading it and there's reviews then of how the person oh. reads it. And this person paused too much or this person, I didn't like the way they did this, this characters made up their voice or whatever. And, uh, I was introduced then to the world of audiobook reviews where you can <laughs> then <laughs> wow, yeah, I never thought about pick that. and choose which audiobook you want to hear. I and never so thought about that. as a result, I stumbled on the fact that I don't know if it's because I have an Apple music subscription which I recommend, by the way, if anyone has an Apple phone uh, I, or Apple product, I like having the music subscription. But 
I'm subscribed to all kinds of things on Apple that I'm not even aware of. Like, oh, there go, there went another ten dollars. Like, what was that one for? I know, oh, I know. Storage? I also subscribe to Apple News, which I I like too. What? Oh, you do? Oh, I don't. I didn't. Go I that do far. because I like the freedom of being able to click on any article because they mm-hmm. they they have all sorts of articles like from the Atlantic, from Vogue, you know, that normally would have a paywall. And I don't want to buy all of those magazines, so I just buy one subscription. They put the best articles. Anyway, so long story know. short, back to the Great Gatsby. No I, news from it Lou. said. Well, you don't. You don't have to watch. You can. You can edit. Yeah, I don't news. have to. But but it's there. If it's there, it's like scratching a fucking itch. I know the world is falling apart, and here's why. Click. Yeah. It's a, oh God, the world is. I'm so I'm so susceptible. I'm a very gullible person. Well, no, that's not why. Do you want me to? I mean, I'm not going to name it. I don't have to name it in our podcast, but you, you know. You paranoid? Have like, you have paranoia disorder. So, you know. That's I do. I think, it, I think it might actually be a disorder. I'm looking. No, it is. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, these, these tours where I have a lot of time on my hands and I'm sitting, I'm sitting with a guitar have it. and I'm playing riffs and I'm just sort of looking back at the patterns of my life. Uh-huh. Because someone asked me, uh, Stephen Drodes asked me, We've been texting, you know, on the tour and we're hooking up. It's kind of adorable. Nice. So uh, he was like, he just texted me out of the blue. I think it was like really early in the morning yesterday. He's like, <laughs> Lou, when did you write Spoiled? What's that about? Spoiled is being, you know, this Sebado song off of, of, uh, of, uh, um, off of uh, Sebado 3. And it okay. also was then featured in the kids' soundtrack. It was the end credit song on the kids' soundtrack. Okay. And it's a very urgent, very anxious song that I wrote in the middle of a paranoid attack, a paranoia attack Yes. during the first Gulf War in like 1990. I don't know. We could trace it back, but I'm like, (laughs) so it's just funny looking back and I'm like, oh my God, I was really paranoid then. Yes, honey. And then I'm like, wow, I was really paranoid (laughs) when I was a kid. And um, yeah, it's like, it's actually, and it, it could be it could very well be a disorder and it could be the thing that I'm often, uh, yeah. I'm often trying to obscure or I'm trying to run away from. Yours is not a, a fleeting, like, Oh, I just hate the news. It bums me out. You, <laughs> you no, have I'm, a legitimate, I'm like, I can go like, yeah. I can go like black helicopter. Just put it that way. It can get there. I can go to black helicopters. It takes a while. I mean, I have to be really, I have to be really hurting myself pretty regularly for that to happen. I've been able to really, I've been able to keep it from the black helicopter level for What's a while What's a black now. helicopter? It's where you think you see, you know, you've, you've ever heard that? Like people like, when people start seeing black helicopters, that's like the, the, the epitome of like paranoia or drug psychosis. Is that like the, really the Black similar. Hawk down? Like the Black Hawk movie? No, 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 like, no. Just like, like black understand. helicopters. No, oh. like you see black helicopters. What are black helicopters? I don't understand. Well, you don't that know. They're like, they're part of a secret oh, society. They're oh. part of like they're part of the greater, the more mo- the, the sort of malevolent forces that are 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 acting just okay. below the surface of society. God. The black right. helicopter. Like I, during the height of my paranoia during the pandemic, I used to see rows of black cars and imagine that these were all people going to their houses in order to, um, whatever, <laughs> in order to, you know, I, it, it goes no, far, finish but I basically what you were gonna have say, actually, I want to hear you finish that thought because I feel like that's part of the problem is, is let's just let it out. Like what's the, what, what were people doing in your mind? Like the worst in my thing. Mind? Yeah, I thought they were going to their houses and working on ways to bomb the library, oh, yeah. and to uh, to su- suppress knowledge because knowledge is be- people are so freaked out by knowledge that they want to kill it. Like there's too much knowledge, and there are people that are actively um, ready to take that knowledge away, ready to obscure that knowledge, ready to violently try to stamp it out as a last uh, a, a last effort to preserve. Um, well, that's you know, control then, right? You know, yeah, and their yeah. last effort to preserve their power, right? And so I think you know, I think people knowledge is power, right? People are so, always people yeah. are always sort of. I mean, power is a big thing, and power is something that I, you know, it's just this raw force, and people can kind of use it as as they wish, and it can take all kinds of forms, you know. But people want to maintain power because they feel if they do not have power, then then they are desperate, then they are starving. I mean, we have we have these very elemental evolutionary 
you know, these, these things as, as little as we are just animals, we are these little desperate little beasts running around. So yeah, I, I think when I'm feeling vulnerable and I'm feeling a lack of control, I can, I can default to some very, very, very dark thoughts. Mm-hmm. So anyway, the song spoiled was, came right from that source. So as I was, you know, telling Steven, you know, via text, what the sort of evolution of that song and how I wrote it and when I wrote it and where I was at when I wrote it. I'm like, God, I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> and I think now I'm doing it less. So I'm actually starting, you know, I'm starting to, I think there's a, things are starting to dawn on me. Patterns are starting to be revealed within my personality. And I'm like, maybe that's what's really something that is really wrong with me or something that I can, I can yeah. work at something that I can, I, I don't think, you know, yeah. I think the less I think about fixing things and the more that I think about, um, uh, the less I think about fixing the more, and the more I think about just coming to terms and being with the moment, you know, and, and taking what you have and, you know, and just taking the moment really. It's very simple. Well, I think it's but, hard for someone like you because you, again, some people can really balance all of that information, the, the idea of fixing and the idea of being in the moment. And I think, that is a, another long standing part of who you are is a fixer. And, um, you know, you kind of having that overwhelming desire and urge to fix things, you know? And so that it all, it all kind of relates, it ties in. Why the fuck do I want to fix everything? I don't know. Oh God! I know. I don't know. Well, I definitely. I mean, because you care so much. Because you, I came when I came into consciousness. When I came into consciousness in the ni- in the early nineteen seventies, I definitely felt like things needed to be fixed. It seemed like things were really out of control. Well, life you is know. scary, and there's a lot of things that need to be fixed constantly, and that's the yeah. thing that's hard, right? Is that just when you think you've kind of got maybe the, a hang of something, or something has settled down a little bit? shit goes haywire again in the world it does it it and and there are really hard things happening and so i think it can feel overwhelming that desire and that urge to fix right things that are scary and and unhinged because i think all of this ties into things and you're not alone you know you're not alone and i and and i think that is actually how we do move forward and how change does happen is that there are people like you who care so much about fixing, but maybe we need some people who care so much about the fixing who are able to balance also their mental health because it, um, you know, and use it in a productive way because for you, it can do the opposite of being, and I, and I say that with love, but it can be the opposite of productive. You know, it can just be simply worrying without action. Yeah, and well, worrying and then, then yeah. and on the flip side of that escape, not on the flip side, but I think worrying and then, and then also just the urge to just completely vacate. Totally. I have that. Yes. I have a lot of, I have a lot of that. Like I have a lot of like, uh, yes, shut it down. Es- escapism tendencies. Totally. Those are all really so, extremes, you know, it's like, yeah, they are. And none of them, none of them really like add up to being productive or actually fixing or helping anything. I mean, that's, that's the thing about it, I guess. I think that's now I realize that, um, yeah, if I'm, I, I don't know, you know, like I'm in a, like right now I'm, I'm trying to write songs. So I have a lot of, but I have like a lot of ideas to refer to and a lot of, and, uh, it's just funny. Like, yeah, songwriting is such a, such a kind of healing process for me, like for real, Hmm. you know, it's just like having things to repeat and think about over and over again. And then I think now, especially, and then this goes back to what we were talking about, like the cycle back in the day and making records and you'd like, you'd have to really think and make one thing and here's your statement. It's like, I don't have that anymore. I can basically just sit back and write songs in my, on my, at my leisure. Like if I want to really get something done, you know, if I want to start that process of sifting through ideas and, and, helping them, you know, come together and, and linking things and, 
and lyrical concepts, it's like I can kind of just take my time and it's actually a very th- therapeutic process. Back in the day, it was also very, very therapeutic, but it was in the moment. So, you mm. know, when you're the, the way your mind moves when you're, you're 23, as opposed to the way it moves when you're 58, you know, it's different. So I think what like, what, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think. I think that too is, you know, the song is something tangible, right? That you've then created at the end. It's like at the end of that process, you have this tangible thing. It's a song. You've created something. And mm-hmm. and that's kind of like your internal, quote unquote, fixing process, you know? And yeah, I that's think. Something I, yeah, that's something I know, do. It's funny to think. I don't know if I've ever said this actually, Bullshit. but I think I do do it for myself. I, mean, I know I do it for myself. But it did. But I did have the the you know the. I did. I did have the fortune and that early on in my life, my songwriting became actually how I live. You know, it became my life, and it became songwriting and playing music became the thing that actually sustained me economically, and so that. Yeah. You know, which yeah. is <laughs> it's confusing for a young, you know, indie indie punk rocker, you know. But uh yeah, I don't know, man. I think it's just funny, it's like the the fixing thing too also goes as far as like if I'm in the the middle you know, when when I do hold back like you and I, like we were I was saying in the beginning, we preface this with saying that like our our communication has to be very raw. Mm-hmm. And we have to say difficult things to each other. And often the most difficult things that you have to say, the thing that you really don't want to say, the thing that you don't want to bring up can become the most productive thing. And for you and I, I, I feel safe with you to a degree, but Agreed. to a large degree, <laughs> to a, large to degree. a degree. You know, as, as much as I can, you know, before the black helicopters come, <laughs> but, you know, you know, mm-hmm. you keep, you know, you keep the helicopters away. So, um, but I think when it comes to other people in my life that I, you know, I do still try to protect them and I do still sometimes round off the edges and, uh, it's just not worth it. <laughs> yeah. And in and, the end, I'm just yeah. like, I don't know if the, the rounding off the edges process, if I look back at my life, I'm like, I don't know. Uh, I think sometimes it's good, you know, to get on with business and get things done, go on tour, you know, follow through on things, finish things. You know, a lot of times you right. do have to make a lot of comp- compromises just simply to f- get things finished and to, to put one foot in front of the other because people yes. can get stuck. I know people who just get stuck and they never they never put the other foot in front of the other because there is so much, there's so much weight to making decisions and there's so much, but you know, you do have to have yeah. a, you do have to have an ease and you do have to have a, a be able to compromise in order to continue to move forward because that's really the only point is like it's moving forward you know none of none of these things are gonna you know yes I do uh, I mean I think when you don't have some sort of like oversight or a goal in mind to keep it where you have to keep moving forward to I think that's where it can become extremely tricky and when you the internal dialogue takes over in a negative way does that make sense like yeah yeah but you know what I was gonna say too lastly is that doing some tangible help besides the songwriting which is helpful but you were talking about this how you want to be more helpful and helping people as you get older I think that will actually help keep the dark clouds the dark thoughts from overtaking and making you actually not useful you know is when you go and you do tangible like that's why people volunteer that's why people get out there and they call people to get them to vote that's why they you know it's like it's a tangible thing that make them feel like hey i'm i'm not i can't change everything i'm overwhelmed by all the things that need fixing i can just do this one thing today Give me all your raw impressions, your thoughts, your words, your time. Raw impressions. <laughs> <laughs>